After Hamanak's favorite girl left with her parents for Tunkwa, he became sad. At night, he would suddenly jump out of bed and run out into the street like a madman. He usually did not come back soon, somewhat calmed down. And so the days went by. Chusuno was gone. Hamanaka shunned us, and Morishima and I felt lonely and homesick. Not knowing how to calm Hamanaka, we decided to leave him alone and not ask him anything. One night after lights out, Hamaka ran out of the room as usual and didn't return for a long time. The night inspection was approaching, which was at midnight sharp. On duty that day was the kind and quiet Freeman Noguchi. Where is Hamaka? he asked. We just left, I answered. He's always doing whatever he wants. Why don't you watch him? Noguchi grumbled. He's in a bad mood again, and we don't know what to do. No harm done. Ni. Nee. As soon as he returns, report immediately, Noguchi ordered. It was already one o'clock in the morning, and Hamanaka still hadn't returned. Even the silent Marishima could not stand it at last and spoke. What on earth could have happened to him? It must have seemed to him that Hamanaka had either run away or committed suicide. However, to be blunt, we weren't really worried about him at the time. However, just in case, I still decided to check the shelf with Hamanaka's belongings. When I saw his things, I realized the seriousness of what had happened. The uniforms were neatly folded. There was no diary or other writings. It was clear that Hama Morishima coming up to me said, Shall we report, or should we look for him ourselves? I don't know what to do. I ran to Noguchi. I must have looked worried, because Noguchi even jumped up when he saw me. What's up? Mamanaka didn't come back. I went through his things, but... Noguchi's eyes widened. Let's hurry up, he said, and headed for the exit. On the way, I explained the situation to him. Hurry up, hurry up. Nice position. It's always like this. As soon as I'm on duty, something's bound to happen, said a frustrated Noguchi. He, too, was convinced that Hamanaka had escaped or committed suicide. We woke everyone in our group and started searching. There was no way Hamanaka could have gotten out of the township so we decided to look around the area first. Since our township was about four kilometers in circumference, we had to send people one by one in different directions. It was a dark, moonless night which made the search difficult. With the Abe case in mind, Morishima and I thought it more likely that Hamanaka had committed suicide. But where and how could he have done it? Suicide, the word evoked horror in me. First of all, I thought of the swimming pool. We sometimes bathed in it but I had never seen Hamanaka there. He probably didn't know how to swim. They said he was afraid of water and didn't like to swim. Let's look in the pool, I said, and Morishima silently followed me. The pool full of water was barely visible in the faint rays of light that came from the main building. Standing on the concrete edge of the pool, I waited fearfully to see Hamanaka's corpse in its depths. My legs trembled with excitement. Thirty people had wandered all over the grounds looking for the missing man, but here, by the pool, it was just the two of us. Morishima stood beside me, clinging to my shoulder. I'll see him, I'll see him, I said mentally, staring into the water. Once I even thought I saw something that looked like a corpse on the still surface. A light breeze stirred the water slightly, and I got goosebumps on my back. No, we can't see it here. Let's go look at the temple, I said. On the way there, Manchurian cherry trees grew in some places and the trees formed small thickets in some places. It would be hard to find a more suitable place for suicide. As the trees rustled faintly, I involuntarily recalled a hanged man I had once seen in my village. He was hanging from a tree like a large icicle. Remembering this terrible picture, I involuntarily shuddered. But even here we found nothing. We kept looking in the shadows of the buildings, in the vacant lot, but there was no sign of Hamanak anywhere. Not there either. How are you? Voices echoed around us. More than an hour had passed, and the men were beginning to lose their temper. Now the whole party was awake, and everything was in motion. Omi, a freelancer, came out of one of the houses we were approaching with an electric flashlight. Aha, confused. You morons. There's nothing to find here. Come with me. It's all your fault, he said threateningly. And indeed, assuming that Hamanaka had managed to escape from the squad, it meant great misfortune not only for the guards, but also for the whole squad. Everyone sensed this and tried to search as carefully as possible. Another hour passed. The search continued in the buildings, at the earth rampart and in the field. 
The sky was getting lighter, and the ground beneath their feet and the faces of the men were clearly visible. At the earth rampart two groups met, walking towards each other. There he is, here, here, suddenly came the shouts from there. Everyone rushed to these voices. Near the very rampart, where the thick grass grew, something like a stone was darkening. It was Harmonica. When I saw Harmonica, I felt a sharp pity for him. I wish he were dead. I thought bitterly of how unbearable his life would know. Fleeing was considered a disgrace. That bastard had made a fuss. You're running away, you scoundrel. The freelancers and laborers came up and kicked Hermanac angrily. But he sat there shrunken and kept his head down. Get up, get up. Apologize. If you apologize, you won't be punished, Omi said, and taking Hamanaka by the collar, tried to lift him to his feet. Hamanaka was covered in dust and dirt. His glasses and cap were gone, his face contorted with horror. Did you want to run? Why don't you say something? Omi shouted irritably, yanking Hamanaka as hard as he could to get him to his feet. But he only looked around senselessly and did not utter a word. Speak, Omi shouted wildly and swung. At the same time he let go the collar by which he held the fugitive, and he fell to the ground in a sack. He seemed to feel neither kick nor pain. He was lifted up and dragged away, while Morishima and I looked sadly after him. Probably, having made his way to the rampart, he was frightened at the last moment and did not dare to run. But that would have seemed impossible to anyone. After all, in order to escape, one had to climb over the seven-meter-high inner wall and behind it there was an outer wall with barbed wire stretched over it. He probably understood all this, but he saw no other way out but to escape. Life in the squad was so hard that most self-respecting men dreamed of escape. A cruel blow fell upon him by this failure, the consequences of which could not yet be foreseen. Hamanak was put in the brig for an indefinite period. All his clothes and personal effects were taken to the training department. Checking Hamanak's belongings before the alarm, I found in his possession a bamboo fan, which he treasured very much. I kept this fan without telling anyone. The fan was carved with the march of the Kwantung army and the song of the Water Supply and Prevention Administration. Harmonica himself had carved these songs on the fan when he was in a good mood after getting used to life in the squad. But then he became homesick, and having no longer any definite purpose in life, he decided to run away. I understood his feeling well. It's familiar to everyone when all hopes burst like a soap bubble. Now we are alone, and in time we will have to separate and live alone, Morishima said sadly. The words finally ruined my mood. Don't cry, I replied rudely. But what will happen to Harmonica? Will we ever see him again? It was August 1945. Nishi, the head of the training department, left for the Hala branch of the detachment. It is unlikely that he thought at that time that he would see the squad headquarters for the last time. On August 5th, Kodei was admitted to the hospital for surgery. The day before, telling us about the bacteriological bomb, he complained of stomach pains. You'll probably see it some day too, he said. A new bomb is being tested now, a porcelain bomb. It is about one meter long and 30 centimeters in diameter. Its production is inexpensive. Since this bomb does not explode in our usual sense, there is no fear that the bacteria in it will die. When such a bomb falls to the ground, the porcelain shell is shattered by the impact and the bacteria, along with the nutrient medium, are scattered in all directions. While explaining this to us, Koide was holding his stomach and writhing in pain. When he was advised to go to the hospital, he objected. If you go for an operation, you will be in bed for at least two weeks, and this is the hottest time. Yes, perhaps you can't stay in bed for less than two weeks. They won't let you out of the hospital quickly. But if you work a lot, the disease will worsen. Many people convinced him. But in a few days the situation changed in a way that no one expected. On August 9, 1945, I woke up from a sound like an explosion and listened to the unusual noise. It was still early, but everywhere I could hear running and shouts of get up, get up, something must have happened. I jumped out of bed quickly dressed in my work uniform, and together with Morishima left the room. A freelancer ran past us and shouted as we walked. The Soviet Union has declared war on us? It was so unexpected that I was stunned for a moment, not daring to believe my ears. Until now we had not even had a light cloak and only three air defense drills. No one had imagined that this ominous moment would come so soon.
The personnel who had come out into the street were discussing the message they had just received. At a neighboring airfield, the red flag was already raised and the siren was blaring. Sumi from the training department appeared and ordered everyone to gather immediately in the courtyard. When we were assembled, army official Oto to took over. With a tremor in his voice so unusual for him, he addressed a Now that the Soviet Union has entered the war, we must take immediate steps to liquidate the detachment in order to preserve secrecy. You must now have a quick breakfast and await further instructions. The service personnel also come under the command of the training teams. Driven by the chiefs, we quickly ate breakfast. Then five people were allocated from each group. With a glance at Morishima and Hayashida, I stepped forward. They followed behind. The morning was damp, but there was no rain. However, as soon as we got to work, it started to rain, which gradually turned into a downpour. We drove out of the gate in two trucks and drove up to the warehouses of the production department, where Koga, a freelancer, said that porcelain bombs were stored. Some of them had already been moved to the boiler room. These bombs were loaded with bacteria and insects contaminated with plague. When we arrived, the bombs were already being thrown into the fire. On the instructions of the military doctor, we began to take the empty bomb casings by truck and smash them against the stone wall. Having finished with one batch, we would return for another. In this way, we made several trips. Each bomb weighed about four kilograms. Working in the pouring rain, we were soaked to the skin. They kept telling us, break more carefully, so that there would be no big splinters left. So we diligently broke the fragile bomb casings into small pieces. Usually it succeeded with the first blow. But the wall grew mounds of broken porcelain. Around noon the work was finished. When we returned to the barracks, we found no one there. Apparently everyone else had been sent to other work. We stripped naked and helping each other, wrung out the clothes that were soaked through, and hung them out to dry, and went to lunch. By this time the rain had somewhat subsided, and we heard the distant rumble of the engine of a Soviet airplane, apparently a scout. Because of the cloud cover we could not see the airplane, and we could hear only a distant annoying hum of the engine, like the squeak of a mosquito. Our nerves were strained to the limit. Team leader Osumi came in and ordered us to finish lunch quickly and gather in the barracks courtyard. Chewing as we went, we went to get dressed and then went out into the rain again. As we passed the gate, we saw a huge puff of thick smoke with a pungent odour, the kind of smoke one usually sees when corpses are burned in a crematorium or when oil burns. The horribly unpleasant odour almost made me vomit. Hayashida couldn't stand it, and he began to vomit. When the superiors from the main building came out to meet us, most of us were already suffering from nausea and vomiting. We were told that Soviet planes had raided Xiangfang east of Harbin and the Aiken Railroad Station, and that enemy troops were advancing in our direction, seeking to capture laboratories and personnel of the detachment at any cost. One of the freemen came out of the main building and, turning to us, said, Now come here, help us. His clothes were covered with oil. Mountains of flaming corpses, the doors of the central corridor usually closed, were open wide this time, and smoke was billowing from them. The corridor led to the secret prison where the logs were kept. Today was the first time that so many people were allowed access to it. As we entered the courtyard, we saw a closed door on the south side, guarded by five or six men armed with rifles with bayonets fixed. We were let through this door, and it slammed shut again. We knew that the situation was serious, and that everything was to be expected, but as we entered the room we were stunned. What is this? Hell or a massacre? Each one asked himself mentally. And each of us asked ourselves mentally at the sight of the bloody corpses of people piled in the corridors and in the cells. The faces twisted in convulsions said that the victims were dying a terrible martyr's death. The work was going on in the prison. Some dragged the corpses by their arms and legs out of the cells, others dragged them to the pits in the courtyard. Smoke with a disgusting odour that made us nauseous was coming from the large pits where the fire was burning. The saves and faces of the workers were stained with blood and oil, and their hands were completely black, even those who wore gloves. I knew that eight large holes had been dug in the courtyard a month ago, and I thought they were for a bomb shelter. Maybe that was the plan but circumstances had forced them to be used differently. The prison room was divided into two parts by a corridor. The west side was called the row section and the east side was called the hay section. The logs kept in them were given a number with the corresponding letter hay or row. 
I entered one of the cells of the row section on the first floor. There was a command to take out the corpses. Some of the workers were wearing gloves. We didn't have any. We had to take everything with our bare hands. When I touched a corpse, I got goosebumps. Judging by the appearance of the well-fed bodies, the prisoners were in good health and did not look like they had died of disease. At times it seemed to me that some of them were still alive and could grasp my hand, as the picture was horrible, but there was nothing left for me to do but to act decisively. I began to drag the corpses out into the yard and pile them up by the fire. Others dumped them in a pit and doused them with oil. Several dozen corpses piled in a heap were burning, spreading a terrible... About two hundred people were involved in this nightmarish operation. All were dressed in khaki work uniforms, and I didn't know who was leading us. There was no time to find... Gradually, I almost calmed down and began to think about how I could make my work easier. I tried dragging heavy dead bodies by their legs or by their heads. This unfamiliar occupation soon exhausted all my strength, soaked to the skin with rain and sweat. I dried off and warmed up a little by the fire but as soon as I stepped back I got chills, so that there were no living witnesses who could tell about the existence of the unusual prison. The prisoners were killed with potassium cyanide, poisoning their food, and those who, sensing trouble, did not take food that day, were shot with machine guns through the windows in the doors for the transfer of food. The wounded were then killed with pistols. Actually, the whole first floor was cleared of corpses. Before the approach of the Soviet troops we had to destroy the corpses, destroy the prison, and take refuge in a safe place. That is why we never for a moment abandoned the thought that we could not consider ourselves safe as long as a single corpse remained unburnt. Many corpses were still on the second floor. In the evening we started cleaning the second floor. We brought the corpses up to the stairwell and dumped them down. It soon became obvious that it was impossible to burn all the corpses in eight pits. No sooner had one batch of corpses at the bottom of the pit been burned than another was dumped on top of it. If the corpses were burned completely, there would have been enough room for all of them, but we were rushed. By 7 p.m., all eight pits were filled with ashes and bones with the remains of unburned meat, but there were still piles of dead bodies near the pit. We miscalculated. What should we do? Shouldn't we dig the pits behind the fence? Will we have time? We're talking amongst themselves. A messenger was sent to the command to report about the difficulty. Some suggested using sappers to dig the holes. But the command did not want the sappers, who lived in the barracks next door to us, to know what had happened in the prison. Besides, the corpses outside the fence could be seen by the Chinese who were used for heavy labor. Time was running out and something had to be done. Soon the order was given to carry water to put out the fire in the pit. We began passing buckets of water up the chain and pouring water on the flames. At first the burning oil flared up even more, but then the fire gradually abated. The yard was plunged into semi-darkness. When the fire was completely extinguished, we began to remove the corpses from the pits. Completely burned corpses were scattered, and we threw away ashes and bones with shovels and pitchforks. But most of the corpses were only partially burned. Disfigured by the fire, they retained their shape to some extent. We could distinguish the torso, head, lip. We tried to pick up separate parts with pitchforks, but the pitchforks did not stay in the burnt meat and the picked-up pieces fell back into the pit. So there was nothing left to do but to pull them out by hand. But it was also very difficult to work with the hands. The bloated and seemingly elastic human meat in the hands spread like soap and slipped between the fingers. In addition, because the corpses were piled on top of each other, it was difficult to pull them out even by hand. There was nothing left to do. But, gritting one's teeth, to plunge one's hands into the greasy mess and throw them we, who were accustomed to corpses, were no longer unnerved by either the sight of burnt bones or the depressing odour, but the half-burnt parts of human bodies and entrails made us shudder with horror. It was especially frightening when heads with a part of a preserved face were found. Unintentionally grasping such a head, black on one side and as if still alive on the other, with eyes that had not yet lost their luster, I felt paralysed by the spirit of vengeance wafting from those eyes. There seemed to be no end to the gruelling work. It was impossible to read the usual human expression on the faces of the people engaged in it. I, completely exhausted, could hardly move my arms, and like a madman, I did not feel that the heat sometimes made my hair burn on my head. The rain continued to pour down like a bucket. Soon several trucks came into the yard. They brought in bone crushers. 
Now a new operation was being performed on the remains of the corpses removed from the pit. The individual parts hit the ground with force and were hit with shovels to separate the meat from the bones. The meat was thrown back into the pits, doused with oil and set on fire. The bones were put into a crusher where they were crushed, then poured into trucks and taken outside the fence. It was getting dark, but there was a lot of work to be done. Bones and bloody pieces of meat were lying everywhere. Soon floodlights were set up, and the work continued. When one of the trucks was passing by on its way back from another trip, a man jumped out of the back and clapped me on the shoulder. It was Hayashida. We looked at each other in silence. Hayashida nodded his head and pointed to the Dakar, as if asking if I wanted to go for a ride with him. I agreed. We took shovels and loaded the car with shredded bones which looked like fine coal chips, and got... Anyway, this job is better, Hayashida said. The rain-soaked ground was turning to mush under the wheels, and liquid mud was gushing out from under the car. Once outside the gate, the car went on the grass. The step was flat all around, and only in some places there were gullies filled with water. The bones were dumped in these gullies, but they could be found here. In order not to think later that they were human bones, they were piled with the remains of burnt corpses of horses and other experimental animals, their heads, legs, etc., which were scattered on top. The work ended late at night. We entered the deserted room when we were released for half an hour for supper. In spite of our empty stomachs, on account of the foul odour that soaked us to the very bones and our dry throats, we could not swallow a morsel. We threw ourselves on our bunks in exhaustion. No one uttered a word. Each of us was given a bottle of a sour drink made from milk. We drank the cool moisture greedily and felt some relief. After a short rest, the demolition of the prison began. After getting chisels and hammers, we went to our cells. I headed for the cell of the row section on the first floor. The cells and corridors were splattered with blood and stained with the vomit and feces of the prisoners who had been beating in agony here the morning before. But I took no notice of this. Boldly sat down on the floor wherever I could, for my clothes and body were dirty with blood, meat, and soot anyway, and set to work. Cell, about ten square meters in area, had a double iron door and one window, a long narrow slit with an iron grate. The floor was earthen. On a small eminence almost at the entrance was a bed of burlap instead of a bed, and in a corner a paratia was visible. The grey walls were ribbed like the furs of a stretched harmonica. They were covered with numerous inscriptions in Chinese and Russian, which a freeman from Takaji's section translated to me with difficulty. The meaning of the inscriptions was roughly as follows. Where am I, on earth or in hell? What do they intend to do to me? The Japanese army is torturing innocent people. We curse it, it will certainly be destroyed. When I asked him what the inscriptions were made with, the freeman replied that they were probably scratched with spoons, for the prisoners could have no other instrument. I noticed another strange circumstance, empty cigarette boxes, which were glued with grains of rice to the wall at chest level. The boxes were well kept, and were apparently used as clothes hangers. A prisoner was given one pack of cigarettes for three days. It is hard to imagine that empty boxes could be used for such a purpose. I thought involuntarily of the life of the prisoners in confinement and the ingenuity they displayed within the limits of what was allowed. The boxes were held so firmly that it was with great effort that I managed to tear one of them off. The walls of the cell were made of high-strength concrete and were hardly amenable to the chisel. For an hour I chiseled the same place, but only hollowed out a hole five centimetres deep. I tried to use an electric drill but it did not speed up the work. All in all, about a hundred people were engaged in this work. Hammer blows were heard from everywhere, but the work almost did not move, and as a warning from time to time through the narrow windows in the chambers, as if from lightning, the purple light of flares penetrated. Probably there was an air battle in the area where our detachment was located, or maybe a Soviet reconnaissance plane was photographing the area. Soon dynamite was delivered, which was put into the holes made and detonated. The results of the explosions were disappointing. Openings of up to one square meter were formed in the walls. Therefore, the operation had to be repeated many times. Having made new holes, we put dynamite, ran to the shelter. After the explosion, returned to the place and continued to work with hammers. Seeing guested by hard labor, sleep-deprived people falling to the ground in the shelter were dozing. No one wanted to get up. It was only the fear of death that made everyone get up and continue working. As the destruction of the building was progressing very slowly, 
the thought arose to resort to aerial bombs, but the squadron did not have them at hand and delivery from the warehouse required considerable time. Continue the work in the same order. We'll manage somehow, ordered the superiors. I had an idea to dig a hole in the earthen floor and put dynamite in it. I managed to do it quickly. However, the effect was insignificant. The explosion dislodged the earth, but the wall was barely touched. Summer dawns early in Manchuria. At three o'clock, the edge of the sky in the east began to lighten. By this time, the rain had stopped. It became known that the bombs were on their way. We breathed a sigh of relief and even managed to eat a breakfast of hastily cooked rice. Soon a large batch of 50 kilogram bombs arrived by truck. One bomb was placed in each cell. They were all wired together for the fuse. Having finished the preparations, people went into hiding. Destruction of the main building. Laboratories and other structures was entrusted to the sappers. If these structures were not completely destroyed, the skeletons alone would not serve as direct evidence. The prison, however, was given special attention. It was to be destroyed so that nothing remained of it. It will be all over now, we thought as we lay on the wet grass waiting for the explosion. Twenty minutes later there was a deafening explosion, and the flames and debris of the prison walls shot high into the sky above the main building. At that moment one could read the satisfaction on everyone's face. There was no trace left of the scene of yesterday's tragedy. It was nine o'clock in the morning on August 10, 1945. The work was not yet finished. The command intended to evacuate the personnel only after all the evidence had been destroyed. First of all, the family members of the military personnel were evacuated and their luggage was taken to the railroad track. In the laboratories we destroyed medical equipment, burned documents. Metal equipment was cut with an autogen to unrecognizability. Special attention was paid to the destruction of special apparatus, which is not used for ordinary purposes. Test tubes and various vessels with microbes and the medium on which they were cultivated were thrown into blazing furnaces. The melted glassware was then broken into small pieces. About 3,000 microscopes from all the laboratories were packed into one room. We frantically smashed the microscopes, although we realized that it was utterly senseless and ridiculous to destroy expensive instruments even in this position. The remaining 50 water tankers of Ishi's system were taken to the field and burned. As soon as the building was finished with the main work of destroying the instruments and materials, it was set on fire. It was not until three o'clock in the afternoon that we were allowed to rest. I worked for more than 24 hours straight without sleep. From fatigue I was staggering like a drunk. My legs were not obeying. Harmonica caught my eye outside the barracks. I hadn't thought of him since yesterday. I went over to him and asked him, When did you get back? How did you get off, thank God? Nothing. He answered deafly and looked at me with a kind of indifferent look. When I looked at him more closely, I saw that he was without glasses, though he used to wear them all the time. Apparently the glasses had been lost when he had been beaten up after his failed escape. I wanted to ask what had happened to the glasses, but when I saw the scars from the beating on his face, I realized I shouldn't remind him of the unpleasantness. The fact that Hanuk had been released was good but it seemed to me that he was not at all happy about it. All his belongings had gone missing in the commotion that had broken out in the squad, and his fellow soldiers were now suspicious of him. I handed Harmonica his fan, on which was written the lyrics of a war song. Mm, keep it, he said sharply. I felt a sudden surge of anger and rage at this, and I was about to break the fan in half, but thinking that we might have to die together, I quietly laid it on the floor and lowered my eyes. Morishima looked at us carefully, but said nothing. He sat there pecking his nose. I thought of Kusuno and decided to visit him. When I got up, Morishima had already fallen asleep. Hamanaka sat staring at me without changing his position. Oh, I'm going to the hospital, I told him and left. The hospital was as messy as the barracks. The likely ill who could walk had already been evacuated. Kusuno remained in the hospital. He probably still had the plague, albeit in a mild form. I asked the orderly on duty to take me to my friend. You can't go to him. You might get infected, he said as he sent me away. How is he feeling? He's sick and can't be helped. He'll probably lie down. I wanted to ask him more, but suddenly a terrible thought flashed through my mind. Would they leave patients who might be living witnesses like that? As I passed the room where Kodea was lying, the image of Kuzuno's mother suddenly came to my mind. I remembered her conversation with my father before we were sent away. 
She was telling him about how she had lost her husband and how difficult it was for her to get her youngest son into school. As I left the hospital, I heard Hamanaka's voice. Makiyama to formation. At those words I immediately forgot about Koida and Kusuno. It seemed to me that the squad was already on its way. Fearful of being late and of being left behind, I ran with all my might to the assembly area. In front of the formation stood Osumi's team leader and explained the situation. Now our army is fighting hard with the enemy in the border areas, holding back his onslaught. There is an order for our unit to temporarily leave the town. It's necessary for all personnel to put their personal belongings in order and assemble in front of the headquarters. The destination is not yet known. Probably we will have to fortify ourselves on one of the boundaries at Kinjan Ridge, since the possibility of skirmishes and death in battle cannot be ruled out. Everyone should wear their best uniforms. We have stocked up on cookies, gale bread and other foodstuffs set aside by the commissary. We will not return to our group's location again, so be sure to take everything you need. Don't take extra so as not to burden yourself, Osumi admonished. What should we do with the belongings of a sick person who is still in the hospital? I asked. Whose things? Nikusi knows. Don't touch it yet. There will be a special order for that, Osumi replied. He probably already knew what fate awaited Kusuno. I returned to the barracks with Hamanaka and Morishima. In addition to my uniform, I took a savings book, a diary and two photographs as a memento of the squad. The rest I bundled up and threw into a basket. In case we got caught in the cold, I grabbed two blankets, socks, underwear and tied it into one. Hamanaka sat with a bored look. He didn't have anything to change into. You can take Kusuno's outfit, I suggested, even though I knew it was awkward to take off a sick man's shirt while running away. Is it good to take someone else's? He objected, apparently thinking as I did. But his position was unenviable. If he alone among the rest of the men remained in his working clothes, in which he had come from the brig, his appearance would be a constant reminder that he had served his sentence. I think there is nothing wrong with that, since Kusuno may not return. I answered after a pause. Now can that be, for comrade Hamanaka objected uncertainly. I understand your situation perfectly well, but there's nothing you can do. We also do not know what will happen to us later, I said decisively, and that ended the conversation. Kusuno's things were divided up. Hamanaka took the uniforms. Since the weapons had been taken earlier, there were no particularly valuable items. The only thing left was a notebook with a savings book and a postcard from his mother. Let me at least take this to him, Hamanaka suggested. You won't be able to see him, Morishima said sadly. The bomb squad had already begun demolishing the empty buildings. Soon they were going to set fire to our premises. I also doubted that the rest of our belongings would fall into Kuzuno's hands if they were taken to the hospital now. None of us thought we were doing anything wrong. I reassured myself that we were trying to do our best. However, we still decided to take the savings book. Mm, I'll go to the hospital, Hamanaka volunteered again. He wanted to comfort himself. Morishima and I understood him well. I took Kusuno's mother's postcard and put it in my pocket. I felt that if he died and I remained alive, I was obliged to inform his old mother of her son's death. We were from the same prefecture and lived in the same barracks, so there was no one but me to inform the mother of her son's death. After gathering in front of the squad headquarters, we moved to the railroad track where the freight cars were parked. There were things lying everywhere, abandoned by the families of specialists who had left earlier. There were so many people that there was no room left for luggage. The luggage baskets torn up in a hurry, the open mouths of the tightly packed suitcases from which the hastily stowed articles of clothing were sticking out with their tongues, etc. All this spoke of the panic that was going on here before departure. We in our new uniforms were standing near the train waiting for departure. However, there was still food to be loaded. Everyone waited with interest for official reports on the progress of hostilities, but there was no information about the enemy's advance. Everyone was burning with one desire, to leave as soon as possible. It got dark. The order to load food followed. Chatting thrown off our tunics and left them by our belongings, we went to the warehouse with food. From there we began to roll out barrels with soybeans, take out coolie with salt and sacks with sugar. The barrels were placed in the bottom of the wagons, and the rest of the stuff was piled on top of them. The darkness made loading very difficult. There was chaos in the warehouse. Sixty kilogram sacks of sugar were torn during loading, and corrugated piles with salt were sprawling. 
Meanwhile, the Manchus working in the detachment were happily sharing the surviving horses, cows, and abandoned food. Since I arrived at the detachment, I had the first opportunity to see the joy on their faces, and before, any of them who happened to be in the laboratory would have faced imminent death. This picture caused contradictory feelings in my soul. Having loaded our wagon with food, we covered the sacks with mats and sat down on top of the load, almost propping our heads on the roof. That night a Soviet parachute landing was dropped in the vicinity of Harbin. From the flare bombs and rockets became so light that we could clearly see the tall monument to the fallen soldiers, which was more than twenty kilometers away from us. Despite the drizzling rain, we could clearly see the parachutes descending, resembling falling flakes of snow. The air battle was becoming increasingly fierce. The bluish light of flare bombs and rockets gave our faces a dead pale color. Now no one had any doubt that escape was impossible. There were some hotheads who said that we should stay where we were and fight to the end. Because of this talk, the loading was forgotten for a time. During this confusion, I saw a freeman leaning on his saber on a coal heap and standing on it like a statue. Looking closely at the conspicuous figure, we saw that it was a woman. We did not know that freelance women also served in our unit. We turned to Hamanaka, who served in the general section, and should have known her. But he too could say nothing. A few hours later came the news that all enemy parachutists were destroyed by the tankers defending Harbin. Hearing about it, everyone jumped for joy. Here you can see the result of parachutist fighting classes, which were regularly held for several years. Not in vain, then, on all maneuvers practiced methods of fighting parachutists, said an elderly officer. It was getting light. Soon the train was about to depart. We were assigned twenty-five men to a car, myself a manaka, and Moriyama were in the car with Ofuji, a freelancer in charge. Hayashida got into the second or third wagon behind ours. The train consisted of thirty-eight cars, so there were about a thousand of us. Ofuji advised us to go to bed without waiting for the train to start, but I, along with four or five other companions, moved aside to get some fresh air. Suddenly I saw Segawa, the laboratory technician. Mr. Sagawa. I called out to him and asked about Koaid. No, he hasn't left yet and he's not coming with us. It's bad luck for him. But you hang in there, you have a lot of important things ahead of you, he replied. It was clear that Sagawa did not want to talk much about Koeda. It was almost completely light. There were still two hours to go before the train left. We were all given small ampules of potassium cyanide. If there is a threat of capture, in order to preserve the secrecy of the squad, everyone must take this poison, said Ovuji, and looked at us all with a piercing gaze. Now that we had been given the poison and I felt that I could not escape death, I felt a shiver run down my spine. I slipped the vial into my amulet pouch. At the very least, this new amulet would help keep me honorable and loyal. Sleep? But I didn't want to sleep. The idea of seeing Kusuno had to be abandoned, but I wanted to see and talk to Koida before the train left. I tried to find Sasa and Hosaka, who had served with me in the Takegai section. I found Sasa quickly but I couldn't find Hosaka. Sasa wasn't sure if we'd be allowed to leave. Hmm, I thought about it, but I don't think they'll let us, he said. Or Fuji said he would, though he ordered us to return in thirty minutes at the latest, since the train was due to leave soon. It is good that you thought of visiting a comrade in arms who must stay here, he said to us. In the hospital the sobs and sobbing of the patients could be heard everywhere. They were greatly disturbed by the fact that they had not been moved anywhere because of their illness. The peculiar character of our detachment made them in such a position foreboding bad things. At last we saw Koheed, who was gaunt from the operation. He lay brooding on the white hospital bed. We called out to him softly. Koida turned his head. Nakiyama Sasa, he shouted joyfully, as if he hadn't seen us in years, and his eyes moistened slightly. We were told that the operation had been successful. But that didn't make us feel any better. The very fact that a man had to have surgery on his blind intestine at such an anxious time only emphasized the unhappiness of this already unhappy man. Hello, Mr. Koida. It's been a long time since we've seen you. We'll just be a moment. We're leaving now. Really? You're leaving after all? Mr. Koida said in a trembling voice, and a large tear rolled down his cheek. If he had done the operation a week earlier, we were finally discouraged. When Koda noticed this, he suddenly transformed himself and tried to cheer us up with a smile on his face. Cheer up, boys. 
Go out into the field, sing a song, and the moping will go away at once. But I couldn't help sobbing, and Sasa cried too. He must have remembered his own recent hospitalization, and now he imagined himself in his place. I wanted to express my heartfelt gratitude to Code, whom I might never see again. But when you part from someone for a long time, it's hard to do so. Mr. Coder, we will always and everywhere remember the days we spent with you. From the bottom of our hearts, we wish you a speedy recovery and release from the hospital. I spoke sincerely, but my wishes didn't match the reality in this case. Of CN get well soon, Sasa barely got out. His voice was shaking. Friends, Akiyama, you probably already know, Koeda began to fumble under the pillow with a trembling hand. In his thin fingers I saw a potassium cyanide ampoule, just like the ones we'd been given. I was stunned and no comforting words came to my mind. After saying goodbye to Kode once more we left. Our hearts were heavy. The 1,000 men who went by train constituted the bulk of the detachment. The remainder, whose duty it was to eliminate the last traces of the detachment's activities, were to leave by transport planes. At about eleven o'clock in the morning the command to get into the cars was given. The train did not move for a long time, and I dozed off. I was awakened by the deafening horn of the locomotive and a slight jolt. We were off. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. It was drizzling rain, and through the ajar door we looked for the last time, as after a long and hard sleep, at what was left of our troop. Most of the area was engulfed in flames. Charred poles protruded everywhere. Only the sturdiest main building still stood. In place of the brick building of the training department lay a pile of ruins. There was no trace of the food warehouses. Only a black column of smoke indicated the place where the warehouses used to stand. The last water tankers were also on fire. And at that moment I was suddenly reminded of the always unflappably calm Akashi. Where is he now? The long train ran, wriggling around corners like a wounded snake. The car I was riding in was mostly my peers. Only half of us had weapons, and even then only pistols and sabers. The senior officers rode in the rear wagons. When we left, we did not think Japan had been defeated. We did not know where we were going, and we could not get an answer to this question from Ofuji, the senior officer in the wagon. At first it was said that our train was going to Tungwa. But when we passed Pingfang and, instead of turning south, headed north toward Harbin, everyone finally stopped to understand anything. Hamanaka and Morishima, who were traveling with me, fell asleep, having been very tired during the loading. I was sleepy too and dozed off. When I opened my eyes it was already dark. The train was somewhere in a field. Morishima was awake too, and Hamaka was still asleep. Where are we? Ni. Could this be Harbin? Why are there no messages? Probably no one knows anything and we're traveling blind came from all directions. Kneeling down, I asked Nagushi. Where are we going? It looks like we're going to Tungwa, he answered, not quite sure. Why don't we go straight south, through Lafu? Why not? I think it's not quite peaceful on that line. In the hills near Yuchain there are strong guerrilla groups organized during the Manchurian conflict. We haven't been able to destroy them. But if we are going to Tunkyur, I don't know how we will go from Xinjing, through Gairin, or through Bizet. Noguchi seemed to be making only his own assumptions, but they seemed thorough to me. We calmed down a little, but then again we heard the murmur of Soviet airplane engines. Or Fuji, who had left to find out the situation, returned. He reported that at Mudensian our troops are successfully holding back the enemy's advance but his motorized units advancing from Mongolia are advancing very quickly. If the pace of their offensive will not slow down, then by August 14 they may reach Injing. That's why we need to rush through that city as soon as possible. Yes, so why are we delaying? What's the matter? Until when are we going to stand? The general murmurings grew stronger. We don't know yet. You better get some sleep. Who knows when we will be able to sleep now, said Ofuji. Following his advice, we went back to sleep. Deep in the night, the train arrived in Harbin. I remember this stop very vaguely. Through the door, which Ofuji opened on his way to reconnoiter, I could only see the crowds of refugees bustling about, and the gendarmes guarding our train. The situation did not seem to be very threatening. When I finally awoke, it was already light, and the train was running merrily southward, probably toward Zinjin. It had rained during the night and the whole green plain was shrouded in a thick veil of mist. 
It seemed as if our long black train was pushing this shroud apart with effort and getting longer. As if our train had gotten bigger, I addressed such a question to the head of the carriage. More wagons have been hitched up at Harbinter House part of some factory, was the reply. Maybe it is a factory for the manufacture of filters, where we were once, I thought. By evening, the officers suggested that the Soviets had destroyed the railroad bridge over the Lalin River, which was also called the Second Sangari. So far, we had not yet been directly threatened by an enemy attack, but when we passed the Xuangcheng station and the train began to stop every now and then, we were alarmed. All the stations were jammed with refugee echeloners, and our train could not move forward. The Manchurian machinists refused to drive the train further south. The Soviet army was advancing in three directions, seeking to cut the main transportation artery of Manchuria, the southern railway. The Harbin train drivers did not want to go further than Xinjing, fearing that they would not be able to go back. Our train was moving southward slowly, idling a lot on the way. Everyone was only thinking about how to safely pass the bridge over this or that river, and the train stopped every now and then. No one knew how long it would stand, a few minutes or a few hours. As soon as the train stopped, we would jump out of the carriages to rest and stretch, making sure that there was no danger. If the train stood for a long time, sentries were posted near each car in case of an unexpected attack. Not distinguishing between day and night, they ate and slept in the wagons whenever they wanted. On the second evening after leaving the detachment we ran out of bread. We had to get food somewhere. The demands to organize the cooking of hot food became louder and louder. Having made holes in the sacks lying under us, we filled our kettles with rice. Of course, nobody had bothered about firewood beforehand, so we had to break down the boxes. From the tender of the locomotive we got water to wash and boil the rice, and from stones we built something like a hearth, just as we were about to make a fire in it. The signal was given for departure. The horn of a steam locomotive sounded, swearing, people rushed to the train. Now we had to think not about food, but how to get to the car as soon as possible. Still, we had brought with us kettles with rice already filled with water. So when the train started, one of the freemen poked his head through the aja door and looked around. From behind, at the tail of the train, smoke could be seen. What's the matter? he shouted. Ofuji came to the door and leaned out of the car. I, thinking that the train was on fire, did not stay still and looked out of the door. There was smoke coming from the fifth or sixth car from the head of the train, and sometimes flames were shooting out, and the fire seemed to be raging in the rear cars as well. Only two days ago we had seen corpses, equipment, and buildings burning, and now we could not look at the fire in peace. As soon as we closed our eyes, we imagined an all-consuming fire like a sea of red lotuses. In my sleep in our stuffy railroad car, I often dreamed that I was surrounded by fire and that I was burning. Naturally, at the sight of smoke and fire in the cars on the running train, we were frightened. Then it turned out that they had built fires in the carriages to cook food. We arrived at Ijianpu Station, the last station before Xinjing, around noon, August 14. In the distance we could see Xinjing, which we had intended to pass before August 14. The city was covered with ominous smoke. By this time communication with headquarters had ceased altogether. We knew nothing about the enemy's advance, nor about the intentions of the command. Maybe the clouds of smoke over Xinjing meant that the city was burning and that there was fighting there. In any case, the situation was alarming. The advance units of the Soviet army had apparently already reached the city. Consequently, our detachment had to act as it was foreseen for the most extreme case. That night everything was to be decided. We took turns on duty and cooked our own food. Some went in search of vegetables. Morishima and I pulled a whole bunch of onions from a nearby vegetable garden. In the evening, Ufuji relayed the command order. Burn everything that can serve as proof of belonging to the squad. The personnel have the most valuable items left. However, we cannot trade our lives for these things. They are now the very last danger to the squad. We became frightened after this order. The rays of the purple sun, which was sinking behind the horizon line, further emphasized the terror on our faces. When we got out of the cars, we began to throw identity cards, diaries, savings books and photographs into the fire built near the railroad embankment. I had to burn the photograph of us in front of the main entrance to the detachment on the day of our arrival. After this operation we felt extremely miserable. When everyone had these things hidden on their chests, there was still some hope of surviving.
but now it seemed to us that it had come to an extreme. However, as gamblers we had to put everything on the last card. Probably, when a man is possessed by such feelings, it is not difficult for him to sacrifice even his life. Since April, I've had over 1,000 yen in my savings account, and now all those savings which had made up for the hard months I had spent in the squadron were turning to ashes before my eyes. I hesitated for a long time when it was the turn of Kuzo's mother's postcard, infected with a terrible disease that cannot be cured. Whether he died of his own accord or was forced to commit suicide was irrelevant. One thing was certain. He was no longer alive in this world. I reasoned. But no matter how dear Kusuna was to me, I had to obey the order. Besides, I did not want to feel the slightest remorse afterward for wanting to save my own life. At the fire I could see the sad faces of people who did not want to burn their belongings. Above the fire rose clouds of acrid smoke from the burning papers, and as if wishing to hide the unpleasant picture from the world, the dusk of late summer soon descended. I looked long and longingly at the charred remains of Kusino's savings book and postcard. A freelancer Fuji came over to see if we had done everything as required. Remember, the secrecy of the squad is more precious than our lives. He began to explain to us that revealing the secret about preparations for bacteriological warfare might cast a shadow on the sacred ideas of this war. He said that the Japanese were fighting for peace for the people of the East, but he never said a word about whether they wanted this war or not. We were witnesses of the arbitrariness that the Japanese army allowed, burning whole Manchu villages, and therefore in our hearts we doubted of Yuji's words. Night was coming on. Now over Xinjin, instead of smoke, was seen a huge glow. August 15, 1945. Four o'clock in the afternoon. A rumor spread that Japan had been defeated, but since communication with headquarters had been cut off, we couldn't check if it was true. Toward evening, two military doctors decided to go to Xinjing to try to re-establish communication with headquarters. They were to be accompanied by ten freemen from different wagoners. If Japan was defeated, we would have to flee after receiving an order from headquarters to disband our unit. Our unit was incapacitated, and only escape could help to preserve its secrecy. But what if the Soviet army had already captured Xinjiang? If they found out that we were Unit 731, we would have nothing to hope for, and then we would have to fight to the last man. With a car confiscated from someone, the liaison team finally left for Xinjiang. We may never see our messengers again. Every one of the thousand men of our squad saw the group off hopefully, praying that they would get there safely and return with good news and orders from headquarters for further action. Sentries were posted at the train. When the car with the communication group disappeared from sight, we received an order to check and put all weapons on alert. But what weapons? We had only sabers, pistols, two machine guns and a few grenades. Having lined up along the long train, we, at the command sabers out bared our sabers and raised them above our heads. So that the forest of gleaming blades glistened bloodily in the rays of the setting sun, and this sight made us feel even more acutely the approach of imminent danger. To Fuji, the wagon chief gave us his orders. Tonight we will break through to Sinjing Station. If the enemy attacks us, we must break through by force. To maintain military secrecy, as a last resort, each of us must commit suicide. I glanced at my comrades. Everyone's faces were drawn out and pale. We were ready to fight, but we could hardly expect success. After all, our unit consisted of military doctors, military officials and freelancers who had exactly no combat experience, and I involuntarily felt with my hand the purse, with an ampoule of potassium cyanide hanging under my shirt. All right, an order is an order, and now it would be good to have a snack. When it's time to die, we'll die as well as others, said Ito a freelancer who enjoyed great influence among his comrades, by reassuring us he probably wanted to cheer himself up. And everyone, as if forgetting their fears, began to prepare food. Some went to the field for vegetables, others gathered wood for the fire. I wish I had something better than our sake, it began again. The doctors and chiefs are drinking first class. Mr. Razumi, perhaps you'll do something for us? He turned to Mr. Razumi, a freelancer. Depends on who you fall for, Rasumi replied and left. He soon returned with a bottle of whiskey in his hands. That's a good boy, Nistu exclaimed. However, such an expensive drink should not be consumed today. Sake will be fine today. You can't drink it now anyway. It's not the right occasion, Ida concluded and took out the sake. 
Let's drink sake for now and leave whiskey until better times. When we get to Japan, we'll drink it there. We can do it sooner. If the Russians have taken Xinjiang, then it's over. If they're not there, we can consider ourselves saved. Then it's not a bad thing to drink whiskey. Do you agree? Ito asked, and touching the whiskey bottle with his cheek, carefully wrapped it in the blanket. And we drank a cup of sake before eating. Late that night, the train started. The time was approaching when we had to make our way to Xinjiang. The carriage doors were tightly closed. Clutching sabers and pistols in our hands, we stared intensely into the darkness. Everyone was silent, and the clatter of wheels could be clearly heard in the dark carriage. As our train approached the Xinjiang station, we heard more and more clearly some indistinct noise. To us, sitting behind the tightly closed doors of the carriage, it reminded us of the murmur of sea waves at high tide. We realized that it was the noise of the refugees who had gathered at the station. Everyone was anxious. Was the station occupied by the enemy or not yet? The train stopped, but we were afraid to open the car doors. People banged on the doors with such force that it seemed as if they were throwing cobblestones at the car. It was like an electric shock to everyone, and there was an uproar in the carriage too. Silence, came Avuji's decisive shout. It sobered us up. Open up, open up. The shouting from outside became more and more insistent. At last we realized that the Japanese were shouting, and somewhat calmed down, we opened the door. The gendarmes were standing by the carriage. The station, platforms, and tracks were crammed with people swarming everywhere like ants. Several freight trains were literally swarmed by mad people. Our train was jammed by crowds of people who rushed towards it from all sides. What unit? Where's the commander? Senior, come out! decisively shouted one of the gendarmes coming to the door of our carriage. It was Ofuji who answered all these questions. When he mentioned the number 731, the gendarmes seemed to remember something. However, the gendarmes themselves were evidently anxious to get away from here as soon as possible. We learned from the gendarmes that the students of the officers' school of the Manchukuo army revolted and began to kill Japanese. The machinists fled and all traffic on the road came to a standstill. Our train apparently would not have an easy time getting out of here either. Sometimes the gendarmes restored order for a while, but the refugees pushed their way to the cars again and again. Soldiers, darlings, let me come with you. Anywhere, even on the roof, even on the step, yeah. It was coming from every direction. It was hard to remain indifferent, listening to the desperate pleas of his compatriots. There's a place, put it down put it down. People shouted, trying to look into the carriage. Even our freelancers, who had seen everything, felt badly, looking at the crying women, the old and the sick. Metzing Kaim's orders. We can't help you, Ovuji said firmly. He was even sweating with excitement. But the refugees did not give up. Ni, nee. who can authorize it? Where's the chief? Naturally, they did not understand why they could not go with their compatriots if the carriage was free. Besides, the army was defeated, and military orders seemed to them to have lost all force. Ofuji had no choice but to close the door. He did so. You can't talk to them anyway. It's better this way, he explained, and added in a tone of command. And you all go to bed. For a long time there was swearing and pleading outside the door. They could have been sympathetic to anyone, but the secrecy of Detachment 731 was above all sympathy. The closed carriage was as hot and stuffy as a stable, but that was of little concern to us. The main thing was that we felt safe, since the Soviet army had not yet reached here. Everyone was so tired and overexcited that, feeling somewhat relieved, we fell asleep. But the sleep was shallow and uneasy. When I awoke at dawn, there was an amazing silence. The noisy crowds of refugees were at a considerable distance from the wagons. To find out what was the matter, we opened the door and looked out. A large detachment of gendarmes surrounded our train in a tight chain. We soon learned that our liaison group sent from Yijiampu station had returned. The group did not find the army commander, so we could not receive an official order. True, one of the commander's adjutants in high rank was there, and he allegedly said that all measures would be taken to send us to Japan as soon as possible. The appearance of gendarme detachments at our train was probably one of these measures. The radio also helped to establish some order at the station. We heard the words of the announcer. We have been defeated, but our state and the honor of our people have been preserved. Do not forget that we are Japanese and maintain complete order.
Will it be possible to return to the homeland alive? What's going on there? These were the questions everyone was asking themselves. Racked with anxiety and fear, the refugees seemed oblivious to the announcer's appeals. For each one of them individually, there was no state or nation, now that the question of life and death was being decided. Neither did we know what would happen to us or when the detachment would leave. It was nearing noon. There were trains ahead, from which the Manchu drivers had escaped, and now they were looking everywhere for people who could replace them. Hunger was overwhelming. We had rice, but we couldn't figure out how to boil it. So Morishima and I waded through the railroad tracks and the crowds of people with our kettle and went to the station in search of some kind of canteen or kitchen. Inside the station was a mess, like after a fire in the kitchen we found a ruined hearth. Morishima picked up some bricks, put a woke on them, and built a fire. I collected scraps of boards and scraps of paper. There was certainly nothing left in the dining room which bore the marks of the devastation that could be of use to us. I found salt and a jar of pepper among the scraps of paper and shards of utensils. The only thing missing was miso, which, unfortunately, was not to be found. The jar of pepper only whetted our appetite. When the wokes were boiling, Hamanaka suddenly came back. Let's go. Hurry. If we're late, we'll be in trouble, we shouted. We were confused. What should we do? Drop everything and run. Empty stomachs quickly suggested a solution. Putting on our hats so as not to get burned, we grabbed the boiling pot and ran to the train. Near the train station we saw a woman moaning and begging for help. Her clothes and face were blackened with dust and dirt. At first we couldn't even make out if she was Japanese. But we didn't care about her because we were in a hurry to get to the railroad car. I still can't forget her screams. Help! Help! When we got into the wagon, our comrades, seeing the steaming pot of rice, spoke with one voice. Well done. We did our best. We put the half-boiled rice on the lids of the wooks and in other dishes, which we found, and, blowing on it, began to eat greedily. At that moment the train moved quietly. The Soviet army, advancing from the west, had overcome the Kingjin Ridge and was advancing rapidly. It was reported that some enemy units had cut off the path of our troops retreating from the front in Zhehi. We were on the brink of destruction. To the south of Xinjiang we came across ambulance trains with the wounded. Once in a while we even came across military echelons heading north. We waved frantically at the soldiers. So there are still troops moving north. However, as I later learned, in one were traveling sappers from Mukton to destroy the main building in the location of our detachment. The sappers who had remained in the town for this purpose could not by their own efforts completely destroy the large building, which was larger than the Marubira building in Tokyo. At times the train stopped. It was approached by locals who offered to buy white melons, but they refused to take our war bonus. Again we felt the bitterness of defeat. We were very thirsty, so we bartered melons for blankets and clothes. I too gave up one blanket for three dozen small melons. Beyond Xinjing, relative order was restored on the train, and occasionally even food was given, though very little. The train did not stop for long, and we did not have time to cook food at the stops for fear of falling behind. We had to prepare lunch right in the car. In our freight car there was no cargo in the passage between the doors. There we put a sheet of zinc, on which we started to build a fire not paying attention to the stuffiness and smoke. Almost at Mukton the train stopped again. We jumped out of the car and ran to the locomotive to get water. We had to run quite a long way, and those who were in the first cars were in a better position. Then I saw the two gendarmes with naked sabers were standing on the locomotive behind the Chinese driver. They were forcing the driver, who hated us, to drive the train. In Mukden our train arrived on the morning of August 17. We went to see the station. To our surprise, it was empty. Apparently the flow of refugees had stopped, but maybe it was the result of the approaching Soviet army. It was so quiet that we were worried. Here in Mukden, a pleasant surprise awaited us. On the neighboring track there was a freight train with breadcrumbs. Now these breadcrumbs belonged to no one, and we needed something to eat. And so, breaking open the door of one of the cars, we began to haul them over to our place. Almost every one of us brought a fork. By the way, to say breadcrumbs soon got desperately bored of us. Soon our train moved on. The road gradually turned to the east and from the station Zichinjiatan went to Korea. Even earlier the order had been received that, having arrived at Bensihu station, we should send a liaison group to Tunkwa. Only one person was to be assigned from our wagon to this group. This group was to contact the advanced units of our army, 
and, if possible, receive an official order from headquarters to disband. Who will go? Ufuji asked quietly and looked at all of us with a sad gaze. There was a heavy pause. To get from Benjihu to Tangkua, it was necessary to travel more than 200 kilometers off-road, snaking through the mountains. This journey involved risking one's life. When the word Tangkua was spoken, I involuntarily turned my attention to Hamaneka. His eyes lit up for a moment. Something must have awakened in his soul. He probably remembered his girlfriend Imado Mitsuyo, but he lowered his head again, apparently not expecting to meet her in Tangkua, even if he could get there. I watched Hamaneka carefully. One of us had to go, and all of us had an anxious heartbeat. Finally, the freedman Itu silently stood up. Everyone turned toward him. Will you go? Ufuji asked quietly, looking at him with warm eyes. Man, someone has to go, the man replied. Always modest and inconspicuous, Ito caught everyone's attention. I entrust my fate to the sky, he said, but his broad shoulders slumped like those of a gravely ill man. What was it? Uh, suddenly to tugged at a corner of the rolled-up blanket, and out of it rolled the very bottle of whiskey he had been saving to drink in Japan. Ita picked it up and pulled the cork out with his teeth. No one was surprised or objected to him. After taking just one sip, Ita set the bottle down on the map. It's okay, drink some more if you want, Osumi said. It's nothing, don't despair. I'm the only one who'll be a fool, Ita said suddenly. He could blame himself for giving in to this sudden impulse. He was to part with us, and I understood his sadness. We arrived at Bensihu in the evening. When the train stopped, almost one man got out of each carriage. All of them were to go as part of the liaison group. And so the group gathered on the platform. It's like a farewell to life for them, each of us thought. And I don't know how this will end, but I wish you all the best of luck, Ito said with a strained smile as he walked around and shook hands with everyone. The train had been standing for only ten minutes. It slowly moved off, leaving a group of people on the platform. The reddish light of the lanterns fell on their faces, and our hearts clenched longingly. One Ito was gone from our wagon, and we were so sad as if we had condemned him to death ourselves. With all our hearts we wished him a safe return. Everyone was silent, and everyone thought of how he could get home safely. At last we arrived in Korea. The danger was far behind us, but each of us valued his life all the more. What happened to the liaison team? We still don't know anything about them. No one from this group has returned. In the early morning of August 19, our train, breaking through the thick morning fog, went over the bridge over the Yalujang River. Our remaining medical supplies and equipment were thrown into the river from the train. So we escaped safely from Manchuria. However, the anxiety on the road was not in vain. As soon as our train left Mukden, the Soviet troops entered it. The bridge over the Yalujang River was blown up three hours after we passed over it. Whether the Soviet army did it, or the rebels who took advantage of the panic, or perhaps the locals themselves, is not known to this day. As our train arrived at Haijo, hundreds of military and freemen crowded the platforms. Among them were those who had left the detachment for Tungwa before us. Everywhere people gathered in groups and told each other what had happened to them since they had parted from the detachment. I saw Asabal from the plague section and Sato from the training section talking to each other. Standing on the farthest platform was squad leader Ishii, in full military uniform with ribbons of honor on his tunic. He was exchanging handshakes with the officers who had arrived from Tunkwa. The advanced detachment from Tunkwa, just like us, had fled Manchuria with great difficulty, abandoning all the sick there. The staff officers who remained to finalize the elimination of traces of the detachment's activity arrived here by airplanes before the Thus almost the entire composition of Detachment 731, except for the branches, managed to escape. New conversations began in the wagons. It was said that here in Korea, in the mountains near the Manchurian border, there was a Japanese research institute which was working on the development of the atomic bomb, and that only the defeat in the war prevented the completion of this work. It was even said that in the waters of Ginzan, where the old ships were assembled, a test explosion was allegedly made on August 16, and that the results exceeded all expectations. It was also said that Japan had been too cautious and slow in this matter and had let America get ahead of her. However, those who spread these rumors, apparently, sought to somehow justify our defeat. I was particularly interested in the talk about Mr. Akashi. People who were on the plane with him told me about him. 
On the night of August 13, the special group, having finished the elimination of the detachment, was about to depart with the last transport plane. While passing by the headquarters, which had been turned into ruins, one of the members of this group remembered Akashi, who was also supposed to fly with them. They searched for him, but to no avail. Finally, the searchers decided to look in one of the barracks, which was only half burned. Entering the half-destroyed room, they saw drops of blood on the floor. To need the blood trail stretched towards a closet in the wall. Everyone thought that Akashi had committed suicide, and fearfully approaching the closet, they opened the door. Akashi was sitting there. Mm, who is it? Oh, is that you? He asked without any embarrassment. I thought it was a little early for Russians. Would you like to have a drink with me? At a moment like this, when he should have run away as soon as possible, Akashi calmly sipped sake from the jar that used to stand in the cage with the chickens. The surprise at Akashi's reckless bravery made everyone's tongue stick to their throats. Akashi had probably figured that if he managed to escape safely from the unit and return to Japan, he would still be tried as a war criminal. However, Akashi did fly with them on an airplane to Heijo, but here he disappeared to an unknown destination. Well, it is unlikely that this man will be caught by anyone now, I thought, and mentally prayed for his well-being. It took us two days to travel the entire Korean peninsula. This journey could be considered perfectly peaceful compared to the one we had already traveled. I only remember that once B-29 airplanes flew over us and dropped leaflets, and another time at night, when several men from the squad went to get water, they were attacked by several dozen Koreans. Ours managed to escape by shooting back with pistols. From then on, we stopped going at night in small groups. So on August 21, at 10 o'clock in the morning, we arrived in Pusan. Here we unloaded the provisions we had brought. And here, with great difficulty, we managed to exchange our Manchu money for yen, but only 30 yen per person. Everyone dreamed of one thing only, to get to Japan sooner. In Busan, we spent two days amusing ourselves by catching oysters at the harbor wharf. There were no ships leaving for Japan and at first we had no hope of getting home soon. But even after the defeat, the army command took all measures to keep the secrecy of the detachment. On August 23, about noon we were suddenly ordered to assemble. We began a hasty loading on landing ships, which were headed for Japan. Most of the personnel of the detachment had sailed to Japan earlier, but several hundred people, including myself, stayed in Korea. They were sure that if they reached Busan, they could easily reach Japan. However, it was only when our native shores appeared in the distance that we finally believed that we had survived, and tears involuntarily began to burn our eyes. Without entering the port, our ship docked directly to the shore in the quiet harbour of the city of Heiji, Yamaguchi Prefecture. There was a school not far from the shore, and it was a short walk to the train station. We spent one night at the temple. In the evening we washed in the bathhouse and the girls invited us to a party. The hot water and dancing seemed to cleanse our souls, which seemed to be blackened for the war. See, those who had arrived before us were also stationed at the temples. Here, the echelons were completed for shipment home, taking into account the place of residence of the departing ones. We saw neither the chief nor the senior officers again. Therefore, neither the ceremony of disbanding the detachment nor the ceremony of surrendering weapons took place but each of us mentally swore that we would not tell our relatives or acquaintances anything about what we had seen. As I have already said, we last saw our chiefs in Haijo. Apparently, from there they left by airplane. At the train station in Hagai, I respectfully, as with my elders, said goodbye to Hayashida, Hamanaka, Morishimo, Sasa, Hozaka, and other comrades, and thanked them heartily for all the good they had done for me. I was moved to tears as I did so.